have so much calcium, which tells us this, this the calcium sulfate's not as high. It's kind of probably, uh, yeah, it's it'd be my pick for a trial, um, and then sample five or yeah, Redland Park one would be my next trial. I guess my other question on the bull paddock is it probably gets a fair bit of set stocking, or you know, stocker always in there, so it's probably more compacted or probably gets a bit different um, usage or not is it, it does sort it of it, it's no it does because it's sort of just like a little yeah. almost like a holding paddock near the yeah. yard so we sort of yeah. put cattle in there for short periods of time and take them in, and you know yeah. just when we're sort of sorting things out for sale so it might have might run you know quite a high density for a week and then be mm. nothing in there for, for yeah. so it, it sort of gets ro- rotated in and out yeah, it's just so, interesting the way that that you've the ordering which you've said of which yep. you'd recommend. Yeah, they are. I mean, the sample seven, which is M, is yep. the best out of all those. It's got the best Mitchell yep. grass that grows there. It grows really well there. Yep. Sample five is the yep. next best, and sample mm. six is the worst. Where regard, you know, it seems to be regardless of what we do stocking stocking wise. That's just yep. how the Mitchell grass. So obviously maybe Mitchell grass doesn't like those similar the, conditions to what your the higher salts. Yeah. And look, it yeah. could also, yeah. Yeah. And I, well, I'm glad I'm, I'm half making sense and I'm half matching what you're seeing in the paddock. Cause I, to be honest with you, I hardly ever do, you know, this, I've never done this kind of extension before. I'm always in the paddock talking with you and mm. picking things up and that makes it helps me, you know, understand the situation, but I guess my, yeah. And I guess you've got to look at historical too, like, once the organic matter or ground cover was lost and it could have happened whenever that country was open, whenever it was, you know, the 1890s or something, there might've been a 10 year drought that changed the topsoil. You know, you don't know when it was, Mm -hmm. but it's just never had time or it's never been able to get back to that, to half functioning again. Whereas the other two soils, they just from looking at the numbers on the test, the fact that it's got more organic matter in them alone tells me that they're probably functioning better um yeah, yeah so so you know it's just it could be a structural thing as much as anything i know you you're intensively and then resting but you know uh pressure on and pressure off is not just about numbers and time it's also about when you do it like the, at what time that's done that pressure on pressure off like is, in terms of the pasture growth and rainfall so yeah, yeah it's those three things it's, it's how many animals and the time they're on there but it's also the time of year that that happens from a plant growth point of view so yeah you, you, you might be you know if you're using that as a as a handling paddock it's getting the pressure that you know that pressure on and off but it could be sometimes or it might have been in the past times that just sort of compounded it down if you like and then it's never had a chance to bounce back for whatever reason but yeah i'd go with seven i'd go with seven and do the trial and seven's got plenty of phosphorus and and legumes like they respond well to phosphorus and it's got 28 available phosphorus in the coal well and that that just sort of yeah that that means that base is really ticked off whereas that for soil number five at at nine it's not low but yeah you've got luxury levels of available p there so legumes always like lots of p so if anywhere will work that should do it okay thank yep. you no Thanks worries no you're welcome yep um righto so that's number six so hopefully everyone if you have got that chart i'll just stop and because I'm sort of going full speed and it's easy for me to go full speed because I kind of work in this game all the time. But what you, if everyone can see, what I did was I just sort of tried to work out our soil type and it's better if you're there so you can pick up the soil and dig it up. But I just sort of looked at that and then you're going, is the plant that we're thinking to put in there, is it adapted to that soil type? That's the first question you've got to ask yourself. Like as you guys know, you've got Brigolo grows on certain soil types. So it doesn't grow in other soil types. So, you know, you've got to see what your plant, your pasture or your legume, does it like that soil type? That's why I spent that first webinar on sort of giving you the feel for what a soil type is. And it is texture, how heavy clay it is, but it's also this CC and total fertility. So that was the first thing we did with the dismanthus. We go, does it match the soil type? Otherwise, don't bother with it. And then the second thing we're doing is just going through this checklist. And so all I did was I go, yep, we've got enough organic matter. I didn't look at the carbon nitrogen ratio, which I should do. And we looked at the pH and we said, yep, it's all right for desmanthus and organic matter is all right for anything. 
Uh, and then I looked at this third one because I realized that there's a bit of salinity around. And so I said, nah, that paddock number six, I, it's probably part of the problem why you're having trouble and getting stuff to grow. Uh, could, could be part of the answer. Just, yeah, once the structure went early on in the, when it was grazed or in a drought, maybe in the, whenever it was in the 40s, sometime there was probably a hard time and it just lost its function. But I haven't gone out and had a look. So, Hannah, that would be the other thing you have to do is get out and just see is there a hard pan or is there any physical thing going on, you know, that's, that might hinder the roots to grow. Um, but if it's that heavy clay that cracks, then yeah, you should, shouldn't be too bad because it, it will self mulch as you know, you know, it kind of opens itself up. But the problem with those soils, when they lose their organic matter in the surface, they, they, it's hard to get it back and they can set really hard, especially when you whack a whole lot of animals on them at the wrong time or inappropriate time, I won't say wrong, but you, you have to use that paddock for obviously for handling, but yeah, you can compact it down even more. Um, yeah, righto. So hopefully everyone, you can sort of see what I'm doing. I'm just going through that checklist. And then I just got to the end there and just sort of said, is there any limiting nutrients? And I'll just looking at phosphorus and sulfur. Okay. So, uh, oh, what's the maximum level Hannah for salinity? So generally the rule is I'll get it back up for you. Get the soil test up. So if you have a look at your soil test for salinity, which is 20, I've got, I've got everyone's up, but if you've got your soil test, everyone, we're looking at this salinity. I know we didn't have time to cover it in the workshop series, but we've got this thing called electrical conductivity over here on this side of the test. So that electrical conductivity is measuring your soil salinity. That's what it measures, the salinity in your soil solution or soil water. So, you're, so you've got your number. Here's everyone's numbers here. And you can see just by just a really initial look, even without looking at benchmarks and where is that a good number or bad, but you can see that that soil number L has a salinity level of 0.23, which doesn't sound like much, but it's soil number M, which is saying it's the better paddock, 0 0.05. So sample six has got at least, what's that, four to five times more, nearly five times more salinity. Uh, that makes sense. So Hannah, then what you do is you have to benchmark that. Um, I won't complicate it too much because there's a conversion you have to do. But if we look over on their end here, they've given you the benchmarks. So they're saying that for heavy soil, 200. Um, but I'd suggest you that, yeah, lower is better. So around that 150.15, 0.12. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a general benchmark, Hannah, without just because I don't have time to go into any more than that. But you can see they've given you a threshold. But just to complicate it, as you know, soils can get complicated. It does depend on the, the species. Like salt bush will tolerate a lot higher than that. So any salt tolerant plant, barley grass down here, we have a thing called barley grass, looks like barley. Uh, it'll tolerate high salinity. So, yeah, some plants are more tolerant of it than others. Uh, some of the casuarinas or she oaks, I don't know what you guys call them up there, or the, um, they, 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 can, they can be tolerant as well. So, yeah, it does depend a bit, but I'd suggest your dismanthus is probably sensitive to it. So, you don't want high levels. So, that's a threshold for you. No worries. Okay, let's jump into the next one. We've got number four. Okay, Navenka, I've got to go back to number four because you threw in that number four afterwards. So, yeah, so again, I'll, I'll, I'll go through that same process, Navenka, but I'm also mindful that I'm not that familiar with some of the improved, I mean, the, the legumes like Dismanthus, I'm a little bit familiar with them because I know they've been sort of on everyone's radar for a few years and I've come across them. But as far as Im improved pasture species that are not legumes, um, I'm not that familiar with what what's up there at the moment, what you guys are being offered. But I'll go through the basics and just tell you if there's any red flags. So that's the main thing I can do when the, with pasture species. So this is sample four, which is J, uh, column, is it column? Column or row? Column, column J. So let's go through it. So if we look at column J, got a new message there, hang on a minute. Okay, so you tried sorghum in it. So, yeah, so for me, sorghum's a crop rather than a pasture, so a forage crop. 
just so, but yeah, okay. So did the, my question to you, Navanka, first question is how did the sorghum grow when you sowed it? Did it grow well? Did it fall over? Did it look like yellow? How did the sorghum grow? It actually grew pretty good, yep. patching, but yep. it um, it was basically, I think we just timed it wrong with the rain. Yep. Um, and yep. again, we used the crocodile to, yep. to do yep. the seeding. Yep. But just looking at those results, well, yep. we can understand now why the seed didn't take very well. It actually grew better than I expected after reading those results. But yep. our yep. whole point of doing that soil sampling was to see, and it was silk sorghum that we were growing, to see if we yep. could um, yep. get any kind of um, pasture happening there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, you can see the salinities through the roof on that paddock. Yes. So, so yeah. So most crops, I mean, yeah, salt bush, that kind of high salt tolerant species that naturally occurs. That's the kind of thing that would have grown there originally. Um, I don't know how how tolerant Flinders uh, Mitchell grass is to it, um, but yeah, most of your forage crops, your improved agricultural things like sorghum or whatever it is, sunflowers or any of them, they're just going to turn their tail up at that. Yeah. So we don't have to go too far to, are you irrigating that? Is that a pivot irrigator or anything like that? No, it's just dry land? No, just dry yeah. lands. And yeah. all we wanted to do was to try if it would actually, if it would take. And yeah. Yeah. well, that yellow tank paddock is a funny paddock. Yep. Um, in a really dry season, it's yep. the only paddock that holds cattle. They don't lose okay. weight. We can't yep. see what they're eating. And that was yep. the other reason we wanted the soil tested mm. to actually see what's keeping the cattle in condition where every yeah. other paddock they're losing condition yeah right one of those mysteries of landscapes and animals all right so <laughs> let's yes. have a look let's have a look so yeah well look it's got plenty of calcium bit of magnesium potassium so it's yeah as far as it's cations let's have a look at some of its fertility um that paddock has oodles of fosh as sulfur so it's not really different for anything else but it's got the highest sulfur out of all the paddocks in in the region or that we've tested by far and away like it's got total sulfur of 930 um and the next one i can see is 305 so it's got oodles of sulfur so whether that's helping them get through that dry year um yeah it's hard to know sometimes you just as you know nature sometimes you can't explain it even ecologists like me just go yeah well that's something we just don't know yet but apart from apart from the high salinity it's got low organic matter which you'd kind of expect in a high saline site because plants don't grow there very well so it doesn't build much organic matter over time if that makes sense um but yeah so the salinity will be holding you back from so whatever grows, yeah, just grab it. So if you got an economic return out of it, if the sorghum grew reasonable and you got a feed off it, well, you know, you, you're doing really well. Yeah, it, it, I wouldn't say we got a feed off it. It was yeah. just more, we was, you know, we were surprised that it grew at all with the conditions because it only yeah. got one, one lot of rain on it. Yeah. Um, there wasn't that much that grew. Yeah. Um, but, we we did the test for both of those reasons. So I suppose um, our other question is, um, with all of that high sulphur and high yeah. salinity, is yeah. there a native plant? That is there some kind of native growth that that does really well in those conditions that the cattle could be eating? My my short answer to you is I don't have the expertise on the the native veg up there and and pastures, but my as an ecologist I'd be I'd bet hundred percent willing to put a hundred dollars on it that there would have been native plants either pastures and or shrubs trees that would would have grown in that site. So the only places that really they saw bare ground when the first European white fellas sort of came into country was often sodic scolds, what they call high sodium scolds that they know there were some of them pre-European times and but most other even high saline sites they had native vegetation on them so there will be something but the challenge is though when you've lost the organic matter and it's probably you know lost a bit of through erosion and just you know treatment 
the last 200 years and droughts and too many sheep at some point and all that sort of stuff, it's lost some of its biological function. And so it's hard to get even those native guys back in there if there's a nice native pasture that'll go there. But I reckon that's something to ask at the pastures field day, put them on the spot. So, um, yeah, because they're, you'll have you'll have a grass or a pasture specialist up there that'll at least be able to give you a few things to try. Um, and just with that one too, like yep. the prob- one yep. of the problems there is the yep. um, Gigi coming yep. into the, it's spreading through there. Yep. Yep. But yeah, I mean, I guess you've got to see, you know, how, how productive it is. And if nothing's growing in there, then anything's growing is better than nothing. But yeah, obviously you don't want too much thickening, but if there's no grass growing, then anything's better than nothing on that particular side anyway. No, it does have grass. That's yeah. that wasn't really the issue. We were okay. just trying to improve yeah. the pasture. Yeah, and yeah. like you say, there's yeah. there's good feed. Um, mm. lots of different types of feed through that yep. country. But yep. we yep. wanted to see if we could improve it somewhat, and we actually just wanted to try a, a yep. crop and see if yep. it would work. Yep. Yep. Well, I reckon with that situation, whatever's going there nicely now is. I just, I'd be happy with that because, yeah, I don't think any of the probe species will be happy with that high salinity. Yep, fair enough. No worries. Yeah, it comes back to the sort of golden rule, uh, Navenka, of matching uh, enterprise to soil type, and it's just got its particular limitation that little area or that that area, however big it is. Yep, no yep. worries. Right, eh? No worries. Okay, well, hopefully that's given you a bit, a bit of food for thought. I feel a bit strange because, as I say, I'm usually used to being in the paddock and that way I can get the full story. So, Colin, we're going to yours, a number 11, because I think that's the next one on the, the list. So, Colin, yours is number 11. Hang on, I'll just get my chart going here. So, yours is... And Colin's was one of the ones that you did a recommendation on. David? Okay, yep, yep, right. Eh? So sorghum early in the year, how did you go with the sorghum, Colin? I think you mentioned it before, but just, just to repeat for us. Um, yeah, it was good to try it. We we didn't we we yeah, we just failed it at about three foot high. We, yeah. Yep, yep. So you got a bit of growth off it. And yeah, did, yeah. Did you um did you prepare the ground or just sow direct into what was there, or did you do a bit of tillage and try and clear it up a bit, or how did you prepare the ground? Um, we just sort of ploughed it twice. Yep. With off offset discs or a couple of chisels or chisels. Yep. Okay. So just chiselled it and then direct drilled in. Direct drilled into an 800 mil of moisture, yeah. Yeah, okay. So it had good moisture and it was ready to go. So you got a crop. Uh, any visual symptoms like any yellowing in the leaves or purpling in the leaves or stunted or funny shaped leaves or anything like that? It all was pretty good? I think it was pretty good until the grasshoppers, yeah. Okay, yeah, I can't help you with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, a <laughs> lands- that, that's a landscape issue, but yeah. <laughs> that's why people that's why farmers are always happy yeah <laughs> um yeah yeah no so all right well i can't help you with them but sounds like the plant and the soil side of it um yeah it seemed to go all right so let's just go through let's just run through it a little bit um i'm just going to scoot back so we've got our organic matter so if i just start with the really big ones we've got organic matter at 2.2 percent so that's really good for that area i suggest um the soil type i better jump follow process so you've got a cation exchange capacity of 56. So it's a pretty heavy textured soil. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, yeah. very heavy, yeah. Yeah, so sorghum likes that. Sorghum likes the heavier textured soil. So we know we've got the right right uh, for the soil type. Um, just having a look down at the totals, the total fertility down the bottom. You've got oodles of calcium. You're, you're up there. You've got more calcium than 99% or got in the top one percent of calcium content in the whole of the world probably in the topsoil so you got buckets of calcium um yeah and then you've got yeah a fair bit of all the other fertility so it's a pretty fertile soil and it's got a lot of calcium and so let's just go back up and look at the salt sort of side of it 
that'll be our next thing. Now, now we know sort of what behavior. So even though it's got heaps of calcium, it doesn't have that same sort of salt pattern that, that, uh, the vinkers had. Um, yeah, so your salinity is not too bad. So the sorghum's probably not, not being towed up by the high salts in the soil, which is good. Um, yeah, so overall, and then, so overall the soil health side of it, salinity is not a problem. The pH is all right because um, sorghum can grow in a higher alkaline pH. So that's all good. Salinity is good. Organic matter is good. So you're only using a chisel, so you won't sort of burn up the organic matter too much by just doing that chisel. Whereas if you're plowing it like a, you know, with offset discs day and night, you'd you'd lose your organic matter. So um, that's that's good. And then uh, we'll look at some nutrients. Just look at we'll look at phosphorus and sulfur first, and then come back to saw, uh, nitrogen. So 18 is sulfur. Oh yeah, I've written it down. Hang on a minute. So looking at that paddock from its available sulfur point of view, which is 14, it's not high in sulfur. You'd call that marginal. So at 5.6, would oh, sorry, phosphorus. We'd probably call the available phosphorus marginal in that paddock. So you may get you may get a yield response by adding a bit of phosphorus fertilizer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's potent. You know, it's one of those things that, yeah, because there's, yeah, the, I mean, no matter what the grass offers do, your sulphur level is eighteen, uh, is thirty five. Sorry, your sulphur level's high, so you don't need to add sulphur fertilizer. You got, you got enough there for the moment. You might in five years' time, but you don't now. You got enough now. So. I'd suggest to you that your sulfur is not a limiting factor, but your phosphorus is potentially marginal in terms terms of yield. Uh, your soil health's pretty good, so you've lined up the foundation, and so now it's about fertility. And so, yeah, think about phosphorus. Uh, I'm not sure. Did you put any fertilizer out? No, no, no. Okay. Yep, just went on what the what the soil had in it. Uh, so the other thing to look at is nitrogen with these kind of crops. So we'll just go over to your nitrogen. 16, 17. So the nitrogen. Q, 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 nitrogen. So yeah, it's pretty low. There's, there's low available nitrogen when we, when you took the test. But the other thing I want to see is the total nitrogen in the because there's a store of nitrogen in your organic matter, and that's the more important number. And you have sixty-two. Ah, uh, yep. Yeah. So yeah, you've got kind of it's not bad nitrogen levels. It's sort of marginal. It's marginal nitrogen. So you kind of got marginal nitrogen and you got marginal available phosphorus. So if okay. you, if you if you were put to put out if you were going to go down the chemical fertilizer route and it's you know that's you know to get a bit of a boost and you want to get a bit of a boost then the type of fertilizer you'd probably use if you were using a chemical fertilizer is MAP MAP which is commonly known as MAP. Uh, I'll just write it there. Hopefully it's sort of visible, MAP, um, because that's got phosphorus and it's got ammonia or ammonium nitrate. Uh, right. yeah. So it's got nitrogen and phosphorus. So if you were to put out a bit of fertilizer to drive it, drive the yield a bit, then uh, and you're confident the rainfall that year, all that sort of stuff, then MAP would probably be the one to choose. Right. Yep. yep. Cool. Don't buy anything with sulfur in it because you're just getting, you're just spending money you don't need to buy at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and sort of rates. Well, yeah. Everyone's got their theory on it, but basically, you know, there's plenty of agronomy on sorghum further south, obviously, where they grow a lot more of it, and you can work out how much nitrogen per ton of grain and all that sort of thing, but as in your kind of what you're, you're aiming just to bale it for feed. So you've got some a feed, feed wedge there, you know, you could put it on. Yeah. It's a heavy soil. You could put it on anywhere from 50 through to, you know, hundred, hundred and something, 120 kilos of a map. That's sort of the kind of thing people are anywhere between that. 
So it depends on, yeah, your kind of yield targets too and how risky things are, all that kind of thing. But yeah, yeah, right, mate. Yeah, worth worth again with all this stuff. You're in a you're in a marginal area. You know, people haven't traditionally grown a lot of it up there. You're on a soil type that's quite challenging in some ways. So it's worth just trialing. You know, trial a trial a rate, see what happens. Yeah, right, mate. Yeah. So does that kind of make sense? Yeah, mate. No, that's really yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. No worries, but I think phosphorus is your, yeah, phosphorus definitely, there's some potential there. So people use super phosphate too, but that's got sulfur in it, which you kind of don't really need at the moment. So probably MAP would be your way to go. Right, MAP and that yeah. organic matter. Um, yeah. Would it be high just because it wasn't stocked high or would well, it have any from that? Yeah, so whatever the history is, there's obviously some good vegetation cover and ground cover there for a period before the test. So whether that's for the last 10 years or the last 30 years or, or 100 years, there's obviously been fairly good ground cover and perenniality in that paddock, at, you know, in the recent past. Um, cause you can't, you can't get organic matter out of thin air. You have to have plants growing it. So I'm, I'm, I'm making the guess that for the last, at least the last 15, 20 years, cause you've had a few tough years. Um, so it must've built up before the drought sort of years. So yeah, there must've been pretty good ground cover and perenniality there for, for a fair lick of time, whether it's the last 30 years yeah. or and it got you through the dry spell. But yeah, that, that's the problem. If you crop it too often, you'll burn that up. So it won't take you long. If, you, if you're too intensive, you'll burn that back down. You know, you can take it from 2.2 down to 1.2 pretty quick. So yeah. So where should we that up? I'd put it back under, under perennials for a couple of years. So if you're gonna yeah. crop, gonna crop it, I'd crop it in rotation. So I'd, you know, do a couple of years of of hay and then either sow it down to pasture or let pasture come back in and graze it for a couple of years and that way you'll maintain the, the organic matter and the water holding and all that and that that's the old-fashioned way that in australia that the croppers used to farm you know you have a sheep wheat belt the sheep wheat belt was you put you put your crop for a few years and then you put it under pasture for a few years and that's how you kept your organic matter up yeah, right, mate. Okay. So, yeah, don't do too many years of just cropping, 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 and you'll end up cursing everyone, including me. So, yeah. But um, but the fact you're only using a chisel plough is that's that's of all the tillage implements, that's the least least aggressive. So that's good. Right, mate. Yep. No worries. All right. So, oh, is that sounds good? Yeah, mate. Thanks very much. Yeah. No, no worries. No, that's all yeah, welcome. So I'll just try and find the chat now. My chat's disappeared. So I got to find out where that's gone. Chat. Oh, there it is. Okay. So that's Colin. And then next one is. D. Kill Terry. Kill Terry. Kill Terry. Wouldn't it be? Uh, which one's that? Um, samples 14, 15, 16. So yep. which one do you want? Yep. Robert. Yeah. Robert, which one do you want to pick on? Or are they all similar? What do we got? You got fallow, irrigated. Um, we were looking at Shane. I was talking before. We're looking at the uh, sample fourteen. Yeah, fourteen, the irrigated stuff because we've got some stuff we're going to try there. Different. Mm. Crops. Yeah. Okay, so that one is irrigated bay. So is that a pivot irrigator? Uh, flood irrigation. Yeah, flood irrigation. Flood. So it's flood, right? So you had a flood irrigation and failed sorghum crop and you had 200 kilos of that went in and 100 kilos of urea yeah yep and it failed all right let's go through it so i'm going to go from i'm not going to go from fertility i'm going to go from the other end and come in and we'll look at type and then health and then fertility see if there's a limiting factor back yeah. down the line so with that, with, with that crop it was actually a um, type of sorghum that wasn't actually suited to our soil type okay so yeah as well so that would have yeah. Sort of why it sort of failed as well. Yes. Yeah. And you can see, uh, you can see Shane how important it is to match variety to soil type because you can burn yeah. a lot of money if you don't do that. And that's why I start with soil type and I go, what's our soil type? Because yeah, that's that's paramount. So yeah, it's a good 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 example. Unfortunately, it cost you a bit, but it's a good learning from. Yeah. So pick a variety that suits. But let's just have a look in general for sorghums in general. 
Um, yep. But let's start with soil type. So it's probably going to be a usual suspect. So plenty of calcium. So it's a high fertility soil. Um, our cation exchange capacity, where is that? Hey. Yes, go for Dave, it. Robert. One yeah. thing. Um, <clears throat> what we're just thinking with uh, where we're talking about this planting sorghum in that country, one thing we're looking at correcting these soils with and heading forward, we've just been trying legumes. Yep. And we've got a very good success rate with cowpea. Cowpeas, yep. yep. Um, so just whether we can keep that in mind when we're talking about the soil types. For, the, for sure. Yep. Um, well, we're hoping for a trip to head up north, Atherton, and um, yeah. about getting hold of some more seeds to try, you know, even some soybeans or some... Um, or mung, some mung beans, soybeans, lab lab, cowpeas. Yeah, yep. yeah. And, and this, yeah. There's there's yeah. some there's lots of cane growers that grow them around Mackay too, like all the way through. Yeah, they're all all grown. Um, yeah, and they all they all yeah, mung beans are good crop too. But yeah, the cowpeas if you if you got cowpeas that grow there, then they're really good because they're fought quite a high biomass crop. They grow quite a thick biomass, so they're a good um, around the Gatton area and Lowood down in the Gat, like Lockyer Valley. Um, I used to live down and work down in that area from Stanthorpe, go down there. And yeah, there's a couple of guys there that grow great cowpea crops down there. So they will grow on the heavier soils, uh, cowpeas as well. Um, and I can give you the number for a, a guy near Mackay, a guy called Simon Matson, who's a bit of a guru on cover crops. Um, I'll send it through to Ann, but he's happy to take a call uh, and he can sort of fill you in on his experience too. And there's a couple of other guys further north, but he's probably, he'll chew your ear off for two hours. So by the time you finish with him, you'll be right. Um, yeah. So T, so we're looking at T. So I'm just going to go down. Uh, so it's a big, it's a heavy textured soil. It's a cracking soil, I'm assuming. Yep. Yep. So we got that. So it's a heavy, it's a high fertility, cracking, high CC soil. So the relevance of that is if you're trying to add gypsum or lime or you'd be gypsum would be the only thing you think about here. You need a lot before you change it. It's got a big buffer. That big CC number means takes a lot to change the chemistry in it. Uh, okay. So that's the soil type. So let's look at soil health. Let's just start with the big one, organic matter. So the organic matter is not super low, like it's not too bad. You know, my target for you guys in that rainfall and area is over two. Um, you're at one and a half, so it's not like you're under one like this one here, but you know, it could be a bit better, but it's not bad. So I'd, that's probably not causing too much of an issue. Um, then let's look at the other suspects, pH. So the other thing going on here is the pH is really alkaline at nine. So I'm assuming, uh, Shane, that that sorghum, one of the reasons it mightn't have been the right variety is it didn't like the real alkaline situation. Yeah, it um, didn't like the heavy clay soils. The, the texture. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But this will be the other thing to be mindful of with whatever you're looking at, whether it's a legume or another variety of sorghum or anything else. It's a very alkaline soil. So just make a note of that. So whenever you're talking to a seed supplier, tell them, you know, we've got a pH of nine here. So does that variety suit? Because, you know, some varieties are not going to like that high, really high pH. Uh, the other thing that's marginally high here is the salinity. So I'm just, to, I'm just going to do a conversion for myself just with another number. Just bear with me a minute. Sorry. It's, salinity is a little bit complicated because you've got to do conversion. So I'm just going to do it myself. Uh, 0.8 times. Yeah. So salinity is what you call marginal. So it's not, like really bad like Navenka's or the other one we looked at before that first one there with Hannah but yeah it's it's marginal so there might be some varieties that don't like that either but it's not extreme so you know most crops should be okay but if it was creeping higher than that so my second question is your, your irrigation water it's surface water it's not from the ground it's not pumped out of the ground yeah yeah that's um that's that's bore water that stuff it's bore water yep Okay, do you know the salinity on it? Uh, yes. Yeah, is it high or low or in the middle or where does it sit? I don't think it's... it's we, we drink it, so it's... Yeah. yeah. You've still got hair too, so that's all right. Yeah. You're doing well, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so, all right. Well, if it's not bad, the, the thing, you just be mindful that when you use bore water in those parts of the st Australia where it's semi-arid and a lot of evaporation, you can over time build up soil salinity. Like if you do that for 10, 15 years and your salinity creeps up, you can get to the point where you hit this threshold and then crops don't grow. Your crops yeah. don't grow. So I'd be monitoring this every year. Every or every two years, I'd be checking the soil salinity, um, and just if you're seeing it creep up, then you have to have a break. Give it a year's break, or let it flush from rain for a wet season for a year. You know that kind of thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, just be just be aware of that. But at the moment, yeah, it doesn't look like it's an issue. So salinity is not too bad. So we'll tick that. The pH is kind of just be aware that a lot of varieties of stuff mightn't be happy in that pH. Our organic matter is kind of like, yeah, not too bad, but you could lift your socks a little bit, but it's not bad. Um, and so, you know, cowpeas go. So as soon as you tell me that the legume goes well, the cowpea grew well, I'm, I'm going to guess at that point that sulfur and phosphorus are pretty good. So let me see if I'm showing up as usual. So um, your sulfur is pretty good at 22. Your available sulfur is pretty good. Um, if Yeah. And your sulfur at sulfur zone yep 8.3 is pretty good so those guys legumes are a bit sensitive to low phosphorus and low sulfur the other question i have for you is did the cowpea have good nodules on the roots when you dig them up um uh, we the, where it is um where they are they're really good um we yep. didn't inoculate um when we planted yeah uh, we just planted in um straight in yeah uh, with this next lot that we're Thinking of planting over, over yep. the rest of it, we're going to inoculate and yep. get more. Great. All right. I'm going to give you, I'll send Anne the number for a guy called Dr. Chandra Iyer. His name is, he's an Indian fellow. He's Australian now and he makes rhizobia inoculums. So he sells into North Queensland. He's based in New South Wales, Forbes, but he'll be able to give you some tips about inoculating on farm too. Like, he, he's happy to sort of share some experience with you. So he goes up North Queensland and he sells an inoculum in a small bag because you can buy peat, you know, in a big bag and it's a bit of a hassle. So he's made this new t formulation that's really easy to use. Um, but yeah, make sure you inoculate properly because you'll get extra nitrogen in the paddock. So yeah. it's going to help. Yeah. But yeah, look, as far as phosphorus and sulfur go, and you saw the cowpeas grow pretty well. So that paddock for me looks like, yeah, it's just, it's a heavy soil. So you just got to be matching the variety when you're talking to the seed supply companies, just tell them it's a high alkali, very alkaline, heavy soil. That's, they're the two things. And salinity is a little bit, it's not, not poor, but you know, it's at the upper end of normal. So if, if they're selling you a variety that's salt sensitive, because some things are really sensitive, like strawberries, they're really sensitive to salinity, even a little bit, and they don't like it. So just make sure that whatever variety they're selling you isn't sort of really sensitive to salinity. So they're the, the three ticket items. Um, yeah, heavy texture, high alkaline soil, and, and, you know, make sure it's not salt sensitive, and then you should be right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you yep. think we need to put any fertilizer on that to, to plant the um the cowpea uh no well i think well the three key production nutrients to worry about initially is nitrogen phosphorus and sulfur and if you're putting out um if you're inoculating your your legume your cowpea it'll yeah. get its own nitrogen sometimes what people do is put a little bit of starter nitrogen just to get the legume to jump up yeah and then once it's jumped up it will start to nodulate and make its own end um i my i'm of the kind of school of thought that i don't reckon you should put a starter in out with uh legumes because you throw around the rhizobia relationship that's just me different agros have different kind of perspectives on it um, but some people put a little bit out but if you do get tempted to put a bit of n out just to sort of get the legume up and running then go in light don't go in at 100 kilos of urea or you'll you yeah. won't get any nodulation and and you'll stuff your soil up in the long term anyway so i'd be going in um i'm just looking for that soil again i'll just i'll just look at your total end so i've looked this is your available end this one here 3.3 and 3.2 together that's your available end you can see that six 
together. Yeah. That's kind of like, but that number goes up and down like weekly because it's driven by microbial activity. So it, it can go from six to 20 and back to four, you know, in two weeks. So it's, it's not a good number. It's like Donald Trump's Twitter account. It's just too volatile. So what we'll do is we'll look at your total N and we'll go down to that, which is down below here. Your total ends 0.6 down here, same as the previous soil that Colin had, um, 0.6. So yeah, it's it's not bad. It's marg it's 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 marginal. It's not really high. It's not really low. It's kind of like marginal end of okay. So it's not extremely low. So yeah, I wouldn't be chucking much N out on a, on a legume crop. Yeah. You might want to put a bit out if you're growing something else, but. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I, if you do, I wouldn't go more than 30 kilos. Heck there. I know that's a low rate and the agronomist in town is going to go, oh, yeah, you've got to put more than that out. But I just don't want to throw out the legume, not, the nitrogen fixation. Yeah. So, you know, if you got a good... Did you put nitrogen out with the last cow piece? No, I didn't put anything out. I just planted yeah. straight into... Well, that's water. telling That's telling you something. So, yeah, yeah I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. You could, but don't do too much. Yeah. 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 If you're going over 50 kilos, you're probably throwing out the rhizobia. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, yeah. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for that paddock. Yeah. Um, I know you've got a few there, but have we got, we'll just see if we've got any ice. We're sort of almost at time, but I'll just, who have we missed? Anne, is there, we've got time for one more. Have we got, oh, we've got yeah, to do no, not, uh, no, Nigel's. Nigel's. Yeah, Nigel yeah. with his. Yep. All right, so we better do that. So I've got to leave you guys. I know you've got a few soils there, but hopefully that gives you a feel for sort of how to go through that process. But I'll yep. get you Simon Matson's number through Anne and I'll get you uh, Chandra's number because you can just have... He's, I know he makes the stuff, but he's, he's kind of independent and he's just about educating farmers on how to use rhizobia. Um, and, he, and he does work up in there. He supplies up in the North Queensland. Um, and he's got a PhD in it, like he's pretty switched on. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll get yours up. Uh, Nigel, hang on a minute. Where is it? This one here. So it's this different soil test. So Nigel, I'm just going to follow the same pattern though with it. Like we're just going to go through that same process. So uh, what's the issue? What are you trying to do on this paddock, I guess, is the first thing? Uh, well, this was actually, I did the soil samples. Yeah, myself and sent it all away, and it was sort of just the whole property. I took yep. it from about five or six different locations over the whole place and mixed it um, in the so, bag. Yeah, sort yep. of. Yeah, in the bucket, okay. Yeah. yeah. So my first question yep. to you is: Did you? Did you? Did you did yeah, and that's all right. No, it's a good. It's a good lesson for you because if you've mixed different soil types in the same bag. It's very hard. Well, it's all one soil yeah. type. It's all one soil type. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Well, that that's good. That so there, we can make some use out of it. If you had very different soil types going in, we, I'd say, look, I can't. We can't really get much from it. But it's a similar soil type all over the block. Is it? They're all from kind of similar sort of patches, sort of grazing patches, or what? Yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. No great worries. Country. Yep. Great. All right. So let's have a look. So what are you trying to do? Just see. Um, Pasture improvement, legumes, what's the sort of goal? Um, well, yeah, I guess it was uh, toying with the idea of like sorghum crop or pecina. Okay, right yep. yeah. 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 Very high salinity from what you've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, good. No, well, I'm glad you jumped ahead. So you've been following. Yeah, and this is the risk with some of these soil types up there, especially the heavier soils that are high in calcium and sulfur naturally. And so they form these high salt sort of loads. Uh, yeah, so... Oh, well, I'll start. Well, let's start with soil type. So it's a heavy textured soil, clay. Um, the CEC, if I just find that somewhere, wherever they put that on your soil test. It's right down the bottom. Right down the bottom, yep. On the second page, is it? No, first page near yeah, the bottom. Second or third page. All oh, right, they put uh, oh, yeah, there it is, 44. Yeah, so you can see they lay it out differently, but same thing, we're finding that number. So we know it's a heavy textured soil. Again, um, we don't know the total fertility in it because we didn't get the totals done from the lab. It's a second, it's a se separate sort of test, um, but that's all good. So we've got a feel for the soil type, which you already knew. Uh, and now I'm going through just the soil health checklist. So the first thing I'm looking for is carbon or organic matter. Here it is here. And we're low. 
So yeah. unfortunately, unfortunately, your agro is not brave enough to give you a benchmark. Um, yeah. Just stirring them up or the computer program isn't. But yeah, I, you need to be trying to get that up closer to uh, one or you know, 0.8 or something closer because that means your organic matter will be closer to two. And like it's yeah. affecting water holding capacity. So, I mean, you know, infiltration of water and water holding, these are in big time influenced by the carbon level as well as structure. So, yeah, so it's a bit low, like, you know, that's that's a longer term grazing management ground cover challenge. Um, would the so, way I think would it be part of that problem? I think it could. Saying, like, yeah, if, if you were doing, if you were bare, bare into spaces and yeah, even if they're, if they're on, yeah, so that's definitely influencing it. So then my question is, you know, how much, uh, what's your density of preferred perennials and if that's pretty high well then this number's not so bad yeah, yeah correct yeah so that will influence it but if you again if you're cropping this is the problem when you get when you're cropping and your soil organic matter or carbon's down that low and you're trying to grow forage crops or any crop uh, the water what becomes a limiting factor in the season is water uh, and I know you guys get a fairly regular kind of concentrated wet season, but it's the it's the dry pinches within the season, within se within crop season, when you get these dry spells and the, and the plants just start to fall over or they pull up in a pinch or they ripen quickly, like they'll get dry and then they'll just go to head um, because they don't have water. So they get stressed and then they seed off. So it doesn't sound like much, but it adds up to yield in the long run. So yeah, so a bit low there. Um, and then pH, well, we got the alkaline, highly alkaline. They're not telling us anything new there. Um, aluminiums, no problem. And so then your salinity. So your deci siemens. So your deci siemens are 1.4 and they reckon that's not too bad. So it's actually from a salinity point of view, it's, it's not too bad um oh, right. yeah, it's kind of like nine. yeah it's kind of like on you oh that see that one down there that next one that saturated extract that's a that's a different test so these are two different ways to measure salinity so they've given right. you they've just given you two methods basically right. i'm i'm just going to write that one off not because it's unscientific it's because it's not used much anymore. It's the kind of more old fashioned way to do it. So now most people just use this one to five water test for salinity because they've, they've kind of got pretty good benchmarks with it. So you've got 1.14. 1. They're giving you a benchmark of that. I'll just do, if you just bear with me for one second, I'll just get my number. Sorry, everyone. I'll get there. Oh, it's Murphy's Law. I can't find it when I need it. Um, but I'm just going to convert it. It's I'd call your salinity kind of, yeah, it's okay, but it's borderline. It's a little bit like the guys before. Just be just be aware of that number. You don't do you have irrigation there like the Robert and Chain or is it no? Nah, so it's dry yeah. land. Yeah. yeah. So I wouldn't be too worried about it at the moment. At that rate, it's not too bad. Um, I'll get my conversion table after. I just, just don't want to muck around on the screen now and double check it. But yeah, I I'd be I, I don't think it's too much of a risk for you, like they've benchmarked it here. Um so I yeah, did. that's yep, go for it. Got a water sample on our bore water a while back, and I don't really have it, but I suppose from that sample, you'd be able to yeah. tell how much salinity would build up if you were to, were to irrigate with bore water. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, your high risk water, if you're using a lot of it and every year, the good thing about you guys is you have that an, that seasonal flush from the wet season. Yeah. So that flushes the topsoil with fresh water from the rain. So that's kind of helps you. And whereas other areas of Australia where they don't get that, they you can really build up if you use salt water. But you, the good news, you know, the good thing is about a wet is that you do get a flush, but you can still build up. You know, you have to be careful. So you just got to keep an eye on that. Like I remember, I think I told you guys that garden in Julia Creek that I went to 
and I was up there on the homestead and it was cactus because they were using the groundwater and it was just killing it with salinity. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'll, that's okay. So the organic matter, yep, that's, that's given that a negative, but you'll still be able to grow things. You just won't grow things as eff- efficiently as you could. Um, and then coming down, chloride. Yeah, it's not too bad. They're giving you the red, but the optimum's okay. Um, so I'm looking for sodium. So yeah, your marginal sodium, but it's not high. And so then now I'm looking for your available phosphorus. So for some reason they're saying to you, you need to be higher than 80. So I'm not sure, sh- I'm not sure what, what crop they put into the database because this has gone through a computer system. So all of your benchmarks here, Nigel, that they're giving you are based on what crop they sort of put into the computer because these benchmarks change. So if you had 80 available P, you'd be able to grow corn high, you know, 20 ton corn crops and all that sort of thing. So yeah, again, it's a, it's 12. It's for grazing. It's okay. But if you're trying to grow crops, yeah, a little bit higher would be good. 20 to 30 would be a, probably a more realistic uh, range but over 80 yeah well you'd have luxury levels so although they're saying it's red it's in the red yeah I, you know it's a little bit marginal but i wouldn't call it in the red as much as what they're saying I, i'd suggest you that if you're close to 20 well you've seen what the other guys have been able to grow the cow peas and things on you know 15 to 20 so, uh, phosphorus so yeah. you know that's sort of where i'd be suggesting for your climate and and part of australia and then sulfur yeah, so your sulfur's like sulfur's all is, what's that? Is something. Yeah, Kena is something that needs good phosphorus and stuff. Yeah, they sulfur. do. It it does. Um, yeah, it's a legume. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, at twelve, yeah, you, you're saying that that's marginal, that phosphorus. Um, yeah. I it probably would go lacina if everything else was all right. I don't think it's dire. It's not dire, like really low. But your sulfur's low for sure. The sulfur's yeah. low, so if you want the lacina to grow well, then probably a bit of sulfur is going to help. Yeah. Uh, so does sulfur, yeah. sulfur help reduce your pH as well. It does. It depends on the form that you use, but yes, sulfur lowers pH, but if you're putting it out at say a hundred tons or sorry, a fertilizer at a hundred kilos, the hectare sort of rate, it's not going to shift it significantly. Um, but yeah, that's how people lower their pH is sulfur um but in your landscape <laughs> where you are you'd be pushing s up a hill <laughs> to get that down over time it's just the nature of your soil type and climate yeah you'd yeah, have to right. you'd have to put a lot of sulfur on um yeah so so sulfur looks to be a bit of a limiting nutrient and and phosphorus could be marginal so the type of fertilizer that would work if you're after a soluble sort of chemical fertilizer is super phosphate because it's sulfur and um uh, phosphorus so a bit of super yep if you don't want to use the chemicals then you could go with a rock phosphate sulfur blend or guano there's a product called guano with sulfur on it um yes yeah, so there's a number of products but yeah that's that'd be the go and again with lacina as you know i think there's a uh a, 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 a rhizobia or you've got to make sure your conditions are right for it but i think it's yeah, yeah it fits that soil yeah. type so yeah d- just Keep an eye on the salt. It's definitely sulfur and potentially some pea as well, but I wouldn't go overboard. Yeah. So again, ask the guys at the pasture day what sort of rates, starter rates they're using for to get it to kickstart lacina. But if they're saying over a hundred kilos the hectare, then yeah, I'd be going. Yeah, do you really need that much? Maybe 150 kilos. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't have as much experience in in a fertility program so for lacina i've seen it growing a fair bit around the ridges and all right down to near where i used to live near um warwick the most southerly trial they did on it um and it was a pretty fertile soil yeah so i don't know whether 80s yeah 80s what you're aiming for with p but yeah what have you read any fact sheets on lacina i should look it up i'll look it up to see what they're if they've got a benchmark for p i did have a read of it a few weeks ago but yeah, a little read. i think it was around about 20 yeah that that makes sense to me just sort of from a just ex, my experience on other things yeah so 20 so i'm yeah so it's a bit marginal at 12 yeah um yeah so hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for things so super phosphate would be probably the 
the product of choice to put out with it. Yep. Very good. Thank you. No worries. No worries. So there's a new message there. Hang on a minute. Oh, there's heaps of new messages. Oh, no. Uh, there's a question there from Colin. Nigel, how many, how much lacine are you going to sow? I think is what his question is from. I think no, you're going to sow that, aren't you, Nigel? <laughs> Sorry. We'll come for a field day when you've got the 12,000 acres in. <laughs> It'll be a long, long time away. <laughs> um, so the only one that's missed out is yep. Helena that's with us tonight. And I'm not sure if there's more than one Helena. Are there a few of you there? They just um, were keen to do some, well, improved nutrition on their, their but right back at number, it'd probably be number three, the sample number three, Helena, that you'd be interested in. Yeah, I think so, Anne. Thank you. Because that's the biggest area that, like, the it's a laneway, but it's the biggest area that they'll be working on. Yeah, and yeah, that'll be what we focus on for weaners. Yeah. Yeah. So, Helena, just looking at soil type, uh, it's just, again, starting off, it's, like, it's number, number I, I think, H-I-J, yeah, I think this is it. Is that correct? Yeah, number three? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's not as heavy. It doesn't look from the soil test to be as heavy as soil type or heavy clay as some of the other soils we've had, but having said that, it looks to be much heavier than this soil next to it, which is number two, is it? Yeah. Sample number two. Is that a fair summary? Like sample number two is a lighter textured soil than sample number three. Very much so. Okay. Um, and it's got, you can see it doesn't have nearly the same calcium as some of those heavy cracking clay soils, but it's not really low. What it's low in is what it's totally low in is phosphorus and sulfur. So this soil type, the inherent soil type that you've got there is naturally low, really low in phosphorus and it's naturally really low in sulfur. So you know straight away that the available levels are not going to be high because the totals are not high. So that's just the soil type that you got there. So whoever bought it, you can blame them. So let's go up and have a look at the soil. It's number I. So um, your organic matter content in that soil is low. So we've got a, a sort of lighter textured soil with low fertility, relatively low fertility, particularly phosphorus and sulfur. It's low overall in fertility and it's got not much organic matter going on there. So it's, it's very low. So I don't know how, you know, the condition of the paddock, unfortunately we're not there, but it's, yeah. So it's water holding capacity, ability to cycle nutrients, all of those things that need organic matter in the soil is compromised. So that's a red flag for sure. Doesn't mean things won't grow, but yeah, you, you're missing out on moisture holding capacity. You're going to have more runoff, less infiltration, etc. cetera. Um, and then we have a look at our, our salinity won't be high. And you can see here that the salinity is low compared to everyone else. And that's because of soil type. So this is a much more, it's a different mineralogy to those other soils that we've been looking at. It doesn't have the high salt load potential from the minerals. So that's the good news with these soils that they don't have a high salt risk. The bad news is they haven't got much fertility in them. And so coming up now and the pH is okay. You can see the pH is 7.65. So it's all right. So pH is okay. Salinity is okay. Organic matter is a red flag. Just going to have a look at sodium. It's okay. So then we go to some nutrients and the key problem here is that your available sulfur, available phosphorus with the coal well is 2.3. So that landscape is low in phosphorus. At 2.3, you're, yeah, it's at the bottom of the barrel. You can see next to it. So does it perform, how does it perform compared to samples one and two? Uh, pretty poorly. It's a bit like Hannah's little holding paddock they've got there at the house. Yeah. It's got yeah. a lot of cattle come on and off it. Yeah. In yeah. different pairs of time and off all the time, but yeah, yeah, it has been pretty hard on it. Yeah. Yeah, so 
that's probably explaining the low organic matter and just probably the structure is not great, but it's, it's inherently a low fertility soil type as opposed to all the other soils we've been looking at so far. So it's, yeah, it's probably its biggest limiting factor apart from organic matter and maybe structure is um, it's just low in P and S naturally. So even if, you know, you know, if you had a lot of P and S in the soil type, you could try and get more of it cycling by improving grazing management and more perennial grass roots and all that. But we haven't got much in the bucket to get cycling in this soil type. Yeah. So on the granite belt down near Stanthorpe, the guys will grow apples and cabbages and all kinds of things on these kinds of soil types, but they have to put the fertility into them. So yeah, so you've got low phosphorus and you've got really low sulfur. And you can see how these low levels are there. So it's partly because there's not much cycling because of low organic matter, but it's also because of the soil type. It's a different soil mineralogy. So yeah, they're your two weak links. Organic, where well, your three weak links are organic matter, uh, available phosphorus and available sulfur. So I'm going to sell you a product tonight. Ring me up afterwards and I'll ship it up from Victoria. Well, I'm not allowed to ship from Victoria at the moment because they've locked us down. Um, but yeah, no, you you're either going to have to supplement the cattle like strategically supplement because I don't think it's going to be economic to put out fertilizer. So you just always, or just use that paddock for certain animal classes or, you know, you're not, you're using it for certain needs only. Yeah. Right. I think so. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. Didn't give you any good news there, but anyway, sorry about that. Um, yeah. So hopefully that helps, but they're the weak links in that paddock. Yeah. Which is different than Hannah's where Hannah, you've got that high salinity. That's probably the weak link in that paddock. Um, so yeah, kind of different, different weak link. Righto. So hopefully that makes sense, Anne, but yeah, hopefully everyone's got a bit of food for thought out of that. Uh, well, no, that's great, David. I think yep. um, everyone that's here has got some value out of tonight. Yeah. Uh, and yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not a brilliant plant person. I'm. I'm. I'm sort of know my basics down here in southern Australia. But yeah, I, I know a couple of the species up there from just going up there a fair bit. But yeah, it's probably the specific pasture questions on which varieties are better in the high pH and all that. It's better to talk to one of the pasture guys. Yeah, that's and fine. Company. And the fellow yeah. that's coming um, to to do these pasture workshops, he is. Well, we're looking at pasture recovery, so native pastures mainly yeah. through those workshops. But the one that we're having in La at Lara will be improved pasture and yeah, and stuff as well. So yeah, he will be the one that will be able to um, yeah give some advice on that. So that should be good. Yeah, yeah. right. So. Yeah, so I guess the key thing, everyone, is to just make a note of your weak links. That makes sense. What are your fertility weak links, and what are your soil health weak links? and organic matter or salinity or pH, you know, what are the weak links? And that, that way, when you're choosing or thinking of plants and varieties, then you just go, well, does that, does that match my weak link? Uh, if you're in more intensive farming, will you add lime, you change the soil, you just add lime or gypsum or whatever you need to, to change it. But for you guys, it's probably not economic to do that. So you just got to match, match your plant to your soil type and your soil's weak links. Righto, I think that's it. We're all done. We're well over time. Yep. So thank that's you right. very much, David. Really appreciate it. No worries. Everyone, no one fell asleep. So that's the main yeah. thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, because this was all the nitty gritty. So no, really yep. appreciate You're it. Welcome, well, welcome. and I think, um, yeah, like I'm not sure how we go now with, um, you know, people have got more questions, whether we, you know, um, you know, you might be able to do some one-on-one -on -one stuff with people, but I'll let you... Even if you, yeah, want no to worries. Know, if, yeah. if you want to do some of that and then we'll. Yeah, well, I'll get, I'll get Simon Matson's number for you for the guys that have specific cover crop, cow peas, all those. Like Simon will be happy to have a chat with you. Just mention my name. He works with me. He's on my website if you want to see a picture of him. And then, um, but he's, he's a cane farmer, mixed cropper from Mackay or the Marion area. And then, yeah, I'll, I'll send you through Chandra's number two, Anne, because he's happy to take a call from someone about rhizobia and inoculating your seed. Yeah. Well, and also, like, with um, oh, well, this producer, producer performance group that we're working with, and if we go down a producer demonstration site um, path, and even if we don't, we're going to get some, um, the, some of the DAF team from over, like, who are 
working on the cropping in this region. So we're going to get them out, um, yeah, and get some advice from them. So we'll see how we go with that as well. Yep. yep. I don't know. So that's been excellent, David. Really appreciate it. And no worries. Thanks for giving me the work, and it's good to meet you guys up there. Unfortunately, I can't get up there and get out in the paddock, but hopefully, it's been helpful. Well, that's right. And maybe down the track, we can, you know, get you, you know, to, to come up. So we'll just um, see um, what we can, you know, get from everyone else so we can uh, the, do our networking. Yeah, and, no worries. Yeah, yeah, no, that'd be great. But really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks on behalf of the of this group. No problem. Right. Okay. Take, take care, everyone. A lot of people have missed out. So, like, yep. you know, a lot of people I'll be sending the recording to. So, um, yeah, so unfortunately they are not getting their address, but um, I'll have a chat to them too to see if there's something else we could, we could organise for them to get their advice. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, everyone. Thank, thanks, David. Really appreciate it. See you later, everyone. Well, thanks, David. Yeah. Yeah. No thanks, worries. Thanks, Ian. Yep. Bye. Thanks very much.